thermodynamics uh, is a theory, uh, a physical theory, it's a theory in physics, and it's a very unusual theory in a certain way. It's so unusual uh, that it's been recently called the village witch. So in this review article, Lydia Del Rio and colleagues say that if physical theories were people, thermodynamics would be the village witch. The other theories find her somewhat odd, somehow different in nature than the rest, yet everybody comes to her for advice and nobody dares contradict her. So today we're going to look a little bit about uh, a couple of demons that have kind of haunted the history of thermodynamics. Uh, but before I get on to the demons, I'm first going to tell you a bit about what thermodynamics is. So thermodynamics arguably applies to lots of different types of systems. Some people think it even applies to black holes, brains. But the kind of origin of the theory uh, comes from the Industrial Revolution. So it's a theory from quite a while ago. Um, and the kind of typical system uh, that thermodynamics applies to that you can kind of keep in mind for this talk um, is a gas. So the kind of classical picture of a gas, you can think of as being a kind of set of billiard balls all bouncing into each other, right? Molecules whizzing around at incredibly high velocities, very, very tiny, and a, a very large number of them. So in a kind of uh, a, small, uh, a small water bottle full of gas, that would have, you know, 10 to the 23. It's a very, very large number uh, of uh, molecules in that gas. So you can think of them as whizzing around, okay? And there's kind of two different properties that you can assign to each of those molecules. Um, first, you can think of the position of each molecule, where it is. Um, and you can think of how fast that molecule is moving. So these are kind of the two properties for each molecule. You can think, well, this one's moving at five uh, kilometers an hour. This one's moving at however fast, you know. They're, they're the different uh, velocities that each molecule could be moving at. And if you specify the position and velocity of each molecule, you have specified the microstate of the system. So you've kind of said what's going on uh, with the gas. And there's lots of different ways the gas could be, right? Imagine uh, switching this molecule here with the position of that molecule there, right? You've now got a different microstate of the gas. The kind of list of properties that you assign, the position and velocity for each molecule, you've now got a different list um, for uh, the gas. So you've got a kind of a range of different possible microstates that you could assign to the gas. And you can think of these as kind of being encoded in what physicists sometimes call the state space. It's kind of telling you the possibilities uh, that apply to the gas. Um, and obviously, this state changes over time um, because the gas molecules are whizzing around, they're changing their position, they're changing their location, right? Um, and so you can think of that as uh, kind of the state of the system changing over time moving through the space of possibilities. Okay, so that's the kind of uh, classical picture of a gas to kind of hold in mind. So now what is thermodynamics? Okay, so thermodynamics um, that you might have thought is kind of dealing with micro variables, like the very small, we're giving, assigning properties to each, uh, each molecule in the gas. We're now gonna move kind of upper level to the kind of macro level. So we've got, instead of talking about micro variables like position and uh, velocity or momenta, um, we're going to talk about macro variables like pressure, volume, and temperature. And what's really crucial to thermodynamics is that these macro variables are not changing, right? They're not changing in time. You can imagine, uh, you know, the glass of water, uh, its temperature is constant, um, and so you could think of it as being in an equilibrium state. If the volume, the pressure, and the temp temperature of the glass of water aren't changing, um, then it's in an equilibrium state. So this is a kind of the crucial thing for thermodynamics. Um, instead of talking about the state space where we assign the uh, microstates with all the position and velocities, um, now we've got uh, these uh, macro variables which aren't changing in time. So one thing you'll notice about that is that if the system's in an equilibrium state, then by definition, nothing happens. We said that the, the macro variables are not changing in time. So this means that unlike other physical theories, um, there are no spontaneous dynamics. Um, so in the case of the gas whizzing around, you know, you have the state of the system and it was changing over time. Now we're talking about um, macro variables which aren't changing. So there's no spontaneous dynamics over time. And this um, is unusual for a physical theory and it's something that's puzzled people as a kind of recent controversy about how to understand processes in thermodynamics. And it goes back to the work of, um, this picture here is Tatiana Ehrenfest-Asavanyeva, 
um, who's kind of been slightly lost from the history um, of physics. She wrote a book uh, with her then husband, uh, Paul Ehrenfest, who's well known as one of the founders of uh, quantum mechanics. Um, and she wrote about how uh, the processes in thermodynamics are a little unusual and not like uh, what we're used to in physics. There's no spontaneous dynamics in this way. So you might think thermodynamics is a slightly badly named theory. If there aren't dynamics in the usual sense, why is it called thermodynamics? Well, um, the etymology of the name comes actually from not the kind of usual way we think about dynamics. So normally in physics, we have hydrodynamics, electrodynamics, classical dynamics, you know, kind of a series of X-dynamics uh, theories. In thermodynamics, uh, actually the name has a slightly different meaning, which is uh, thermo means heat and work is referred to by the dynamics, work or power. So heat and work are very central uh, to thermodynamics. So what are heat and work? So this equation says that the change in energy, so the D is like the differential, so the change in energy of the system is the change in energy due to heat plus the change in energy due to work. And you might think, well, that's a little unsurprising. The idea that energy is conserved is kind of like a cornerstone of modern physics, so central that violations of that seem kind of unimaginable. And to us, uh, the kind of D, the E in this equation is kind of the most well understood quantity uh, in that equation, but that, historically that wasn't so. Um, so historically, heat and work uh, were better understood uh, than energy. But that was at a time when the metaphysical picture, the, what the nature of um, heat was, was vastly different from what we think today. So previously, uh, heat was thought to be an invisible fluid known as caloric. Um, and Caloric has some kind of explanatory successes. Um, for instance, uh, the idea that the kind of particles in the invisible fluid would repel each other could explain why um, heat flows from cold to hot. If the, you know, the invisible uh, particles of caloric repelled each other, then that would explain it go from the kind of high density to the lower density, right? This was a, a theory of Lavoisier. And so whilst it was successful in, in some ways, Clearly, we no longer believe in cal caloric, but also it was kind of shown to not quite fit the bill um, in the following way. So uh, another character in the kind of history of thermodynamics um, is somebody called uh, William Thompson, who is later known as Count Rumford. Um, and he was overseeing uh, artillery uh, kind of production in Munich. He kind of uh, fled from uh, America and in fact, actually, the English gardens in Munich were, were his design. Um, but he, he was overseeing this uh, artillery, and he saw that when they were kind of boring holes in cannons, there was kind of no limit to the amount of heat that was generated, which didn't seem to really fit with um, how people thought about caloric, because the idea was that eventually you'd run out of heat, you'd run out of the kind of invisible fluid, right? And he also kind of compared kind of shards of metal that came out of kind of boring cannons um, with ones which had had not been kind of undergone this kind of process. And they didn't seem very different. Whereas really the caloric theory would say they should be quite different because one had contained caloric and the other didn't. So he came to the conclusion that the kind of source of the heat was generated by friction. And it didn't seem to run out, which if you thought it was a fluid, you think eventually you'd run out of, uh, run out of the fluid. So he concluded that uh, heat cannot possibly be a material substance and instead concluded that it must be motion. So that was the kind of uh, end of the caloric theory. Um, and there's a kind of gossipy twist. So Lavoisier was famously beheaded in the, in, um, in the French Revolution. And not only was his theory shown not to be correct, uh, to add insult to injury, uh, Rumford then married his widow. <laughs> so we no longer think of heat and work in, the, uh, in those terms. How do we think of them now today? So we think of heat and work as being two different types of energy transfer. So Heat, you can think of as being the kind of random motion of the molecules. So if you have a, a box of gas, or I don't know, think of a, a balloon. Uh, you put it next to uh, a radiator. Energy as heat gets transferred to uh, the balloon. The molecules start moving faster. That's a different type of energy transfer than imagine having a box of gas, and then you uh, push in a piston compressing the gas, or the gas can do work on the piston and expand, uh, expand uh, the, the volume of the box. So they're, they're kind of two different 
ways of thinking about it. So, so Maxwell, one of the another kind of key figure in the history of thermodynamics, referred to this as ordered versus disordered motion. So why do we care about this distinction between two different uh, types of energy transfer? Well, now people in philosophy care about it because they want to understand uh, kind of what physical theories are telling us. But at the time, there was kind of a much more prosaic uh, consideration, which was they wanted to be able to build steam engines. So the idea here is, so, you know, instead of a candle, as is in the picture, you can imagine, you know, uh, a coal fire kind of underneath the uh, box of gas in the uh, steam engine, right? So what happens is energy is transferred to the gas as heat. So you kind of, uh, the energy associated to the gas increases because you've heated it up using, uh, well, a candle or a coal fire. The gas then does work on the system. So it uh, pushes the piston. So what we've done is we've transferred energy uh, as heat into work. And work is useful, right? Work is what allows, if we have this piston that gets pushed up, you can imagine that being attached to some kind of crank that then turns the wheels of the steam engine. So that's the kind of thing that we want to be able to get out of the system. Useful work. But there are kind of limits to this. So we can trans transform heat into work, but not, we can't transfer all the energy as heat into work. And this is one way of saying what the second law of thermodynamics is about. There are limitations on how much uh, energy can be transferred as heat and then can be converted into work. So uh, one statement of the second law is this. It's impossible to perform a cyclic process with no other result than that heat is absorbed from a reservoir and that work is done. But the more familiar version you might have in mind of the um, second law is this idea that entropy can't decrease. So this quantity here, this ds, s is normally used to represent entropy, um, there's this quantity and it can't decrease in these thermodynamic cases. So when, when we transfer energy uh, to the gas by the coal fire, we, that causes the piston to move. Uh, and then uh, that will then run the steam engine, but we can't use all of the energy. And in particular, we can't do it in such a way that entropy would decrease. So what is entropy? Now, there's lots of different uh, definitions and types of entropy. When one of the founders of uh, quantum mechanics came up with a new quantity, he said to an, another person who came up with another, yes, another definition of entropy, you know, you've got this quantity, it looks a bit like entropy. Call it entropy because nobody really knows what entropy is, and so you'll always have the upper hand in an argument. Um, so if you just want a kind of heuristic way to think about entropy for the purposes of this talk, you can think of it as being a, a measure of disorder. The kind of matchbox uh, state looks a bit more disordered on the right than it is on the left because there are more possible ways to arrange the matches like they are on the right-hand side than they are on the left-hand side, right? There's only one way to neatly line them all up. But there's loads of different ways you could have for like putting them any which way. So there's more possible, to go back to the earlier um, discussion of the, the molecules in the gas, there's more possible ways that the system can be in this disordered state than there are in the state on the left-hand side. So if, imagine the, the gas, if you have it confined to a small corner of the room, uh, there's a certain number of ways that the, the molecules could be arranged. Now imagine that it can uh, explore the whole room. There's now loads more different possible positions that each uh, gas molecule could have, and so there's a lot more possible microstates. So this is the sense in which uh, there's more possible microstates associated with the matches on the right-hand side than on the left-hand side, and that's one way of thinking that the entropy of the state of the system on the right-hand side is higher than the entropy on the left-hand side. And, and this has been you know, famously connected to the direction of time. The idea that entropy can't uh, decrease is meant to somehow give us the arrow of time, and it's very controversial how you do that. But one thing that's important to notice is that there's two laws about time asymmetry in thermodynamics. So um, there's this lovely paper by uh, two philosophers of physics, Joseph Fink and Harvey Brown, where they say, well, you know, there's not just the second law, and there's, of, of course, also the first law and the zeroth law of thermodynamics. There's also another law, the minus first law, which is kind of a presupposition of the whole theory, which is that a system will approach a state of equilibrium. Remember, that was uh, the state where uh, the macro parameters weren't changing in time. So the, the volume and pressure and temperature don't change. 
um, it will approach that state from the non-equilibrium state. So that's to say, if we put the ice cube in the glass of water, the system will eventually reach a state of equilibrium where the temperature is the same throughout the whole glass of water, the volume's constant, and the pressure's constant. As the ice cube melts, eventually the system will reach a state of equilibrium. And they say this is so central to thermodynamics, they could even be called the minus infinite law. Is that that important? Okay, so now hopefully you've got a little bit of an idea about what thermodynamics is. So now on to the demons. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.